1984, Jennifer Thompson was asleep when a man broke into her apartment, set her phone lines, and sexually assaulted her. She escaped and identified Ronald Cotton as her attacker. Although Ronald insisted that he was innocent, Jennifer's positive identification of him and aligned him kept him behind bars. After spending 10 years of his life in prison, Robert took a DNA test that proved his innocence and he was released. Unfortunately, misidentifications such as this one happen frequently, and innocent people are put in jail, allowing the actual criminals to roam free. In the case of Jennifer Thompson, the real perpetrator was eventually found. But in many cases, the actual criminal is still out there waiting to commit the crime again. This is why I believe that state and federal courts should implement the eyewitness testimony guidelines that were recently put in place by the New Jersey Supreme Court. In this speech, I will talk about our current eyewitness testimony guidelines and how these guidelines should be revised, and then I will propose a two-step solution as well as addressing opposing arguments. Before I continue, there are two aspects of our current eyewitness testimony guidelines that we should understand. The first aspect is that in the court case of Manson v. Brathwaite in 1977, the Supreme Court established a five-factor test of reliability of eyewitness testimony in order to curb the high rate of misidentifications that were taking place. The main problem with the Manson ruling, Manson ruling is that the five factors proved not to be good indicators of eyewitness reliability because they didn't include the psychological processes that can affect an eyewitness's memory. According to Supreme Court correspondent Adam Liptick, nearly 2,000 studies of psychological and sociological research has been published that show, that show the unreliability of eyewitness memory. The second aspect is that the Supreme Court is currently hearing the case of Perry v. New Hampshire in order to determine if there needs to be more safeguards against the use of eyewitness testimony. The Supreme Court seems resistant to make any changes despite the mounting evidence that eyewitness testimony is unreliable. Federal and state courts are not implementing the revised guidelines needed in order to stop these false convictions, and this is resulting in three harmful consequences. The first harm is that we are allowing false eyewitness testimony in our court systems. Eyewitness scientists say that, the human that human memory, just like physical objects, can be contaminated. This contamination can come from suggestive police procedures, external influences, or even just the decay of memory over time. Eyewitnesses are often called upon to remember things they saw in extremely stressful situations months or even years after it happened, allowing a lot of time for suggestive information to shape their memory. A handful of studies have recently emerged in which its participants are simply asked if they have seen video footage of well-known news events, even though no such video footage exists. In a study done by Dr. James Oss and Part Anders Grantmog in Sweden in 2009, they found that 24% of a sweet, 64% of, I'm sorry, 64% of a Swedish sample said they had seen non-existent video footage of attack on the foreign Swedish minister, and 19% went on to describe details in the form of written narratives. These studies easily elicited false memory in its participants and shows how easily suggestiveness can shape an eyewitness's memory. The second harm is that juries are giving too much weight to eyewitness testimony in their decision making. According to previous Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan, there is nothing more convincing to a jury than a live human who will take the stand, point a finger at the defendant, and say that's the one. Juries are overestimating the validity of eyewitness testimony because they are unaware of all the factors that can compromise an eyewitness's memory. According to psychologist Alvin Goldstein, nearly 80,000 people a year are convicted solely based on evidence from eyewitness testimony. Obviously, juries are basing a lot of their evidence off of eyewitness testimony, so we need all the safeguards possible to guarantee that we are not putting innocent people in jail. With nearly 600,000 people serving on juries a year, any one of us could easily serve on jury duty. We need all the necessary information and facts to guarantee that we are not putting innocent people in jail. The third harm is that we are allowing for these innocent people to go to jail. According to the nonprofit legal organization, The Innocence Project, there have been 273 wrongful convictions confirmed over the past two decades by DNA exonerations. Misidentifications played a part in three-fourths of these wrongful convictions. Stephen Penrod, a psychology professor at John Jay's College of Criminal Justice, analyzed more than a dozen studies and found a misidentification rate of 24%. This affects every one of us because every time that an innocent person is put in jail in the place of an actual criminal, it increases the likelihood that we could be the victim of a crime in the future. So what can we do about these problems? My two-step plan will lower, the, will lower the frequency of these misidentifications and lessen the likelihood that innocent people are going to jail. 
The first step in the plan is for federal and state courts to implement the eyewitness testimony guidelines that were recently put in place by the New Jersey Supreme Court. The New Jersey guidelines are just two steps. The first is that if a defendant can show any form of any evidence of suggestiveness, then all relevant variables should be explored at pretrial hearings. Secondly, the jury should be instructed about the various factors that can affect an eyewitness's memory, such as decay of memory and false memory. This will both protect the rights of the defendants and lessen the power of eyewitness testimony in jury's decisions. The second step of my plan is for federal and state courts to require that all police use double bind lineups, double bind photo identifications, and sequential lineups in their police procedures. A double bind lineup is when the police officer conducting the lineup is unaware of the identity of the suspect and therefore no suggestiveness can take place. A sequential lineup is when the eyewitness is shown a photo one at a time and then after each photo they have to decide whether that person was the one who committed the crime or not. This will stop them from just comparing all the pictures and just picking the person that is most similar, that looks most similar to the person that committed the crime. In a national study done by the American Judicature Society in 2011, they tested the effectiveness of sequential and double bind lineups in four police departments in Austin, Texas. They found that double bind lineups and sequential lineups produce less mistaken identifications than traditional methods. Law enforcement agencies in New Jersey, Massachusetts, Minnesota, and other areas have all cited the advantages of sequential lineups and double bind lineups, um, including increased confidence in the accuracy of identifications, uniformity of procedures, consistent training methods of new officers about eyewitness testimony, and ultimately eyewitness evidence that holds up better in court. But in order to recognize, in order to recognize both sides of the issue, let's look at three arguments made by the other side. The first argument is that double line lineups are less efficient in police procedures and therefore they aren't worth the extra personnel they require. In the book Convicting the Innocent by Brandon Garrett, he found that nearly three-fourths of misidentifications were due to suggestive police procedures. Since double line lineups eliminate so much of this problem, it is definitely worth the extra precaution. In the second argument, some people say that revised jury instructions aren't needed because cross-examination of an eyewitness should be enough to determine if their testimony is false or not. The problem with the current jury instructions is that it doesn't include the psychological processes that can affect an eyewitness's memory, such as decay of memory and false memory. Even if a lawyer chooses to talk about the implications of false memory, the jury is less likely to listen to a lawyer who obviously wants to win his case versus a judge who is unbiased. The third argument is that the small amount of innocent people put in jail is worth the large amount of criminals put in jail because of eyewitness testimony. In my plan, I'm not saying we should eliminate eyewitness testimony. I'm just saying that eyewitness testimony guidelines should be revised. This will only stop innocent people, this will only prevent innocent people from going to jail, but it won't affect the actual criminals from going to jail. For example, previous district attorney, now U.S. Senator Amy Klobuchar, made double bind lines mandatory in Hennepin County, Minnesota, after a field study showed that it resulted in a decrease in mistaken identifications with no apparent decrease in positive IDs. So, in conclusion, people wrongfully charged with a crime such as Robert Cottage should not have to spend years of their life in prison for a crime they didn't commit. Because we are not implementing these revised guidelines, we are allowing false eyewitness testimony in our courts to continue, juries are relying too much on eyewitness testimony in their decisions, and innocent people are going to jail. Federal and state courts must implement these revised guidelines in order to guarantee that we have a fair and just court system. Thank you.